welcome to the Two Texts Podcast. I'm here with my co-host John Andrews, and my name is David Harvey. This is a podcast of two friends from two different countries, meeting every two weeks to talk about the Bible. Each week we pick one text to talk about, which invariably leads us to talking about two texts and often many more. This season, we're taking a long, slow journey through the book of Acts to explore how the first Christians encountered the disruptive presence of the Holy Spirit. So, John, the last time we were together, we had Paul approaching a sermon in Athens. So there's a a little bit of a... uh, question being asked around around what it is that Paul's saying amongst a group of people who who love to hear new things and new teaching uh, and so we we've sort of built the whole story up in the last couple of episodes right up to Paul mm. beginning to preach and so mm. in this episode we're going to jump into Paul's sermon itself aren't we yeah yeah and I, I tell you what one of the things that I just saw in a fresh way reading it through again Verse 19, it says, Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. And it, it really it really reinforced the sense again that this is this wasn't just a discussion. It was almost a trial, really, wasn't it? Mm. These people were, were bringing him to a place of trial to discuss this. I think if we're not careful, we, we almost reduce... I mean, we're about to lean into the Sermon of Paul, but we almost reduce, almost reduce it to a little bit of a, oh, well, we're in a debate, we're having a wee bit of a chat, but it's actually Paul is defending mm-hmm. something. He is being asked to put his case in this court. So I, I think as even we come to hear the sermon, it's recognizing that although it's a, a summary little sermon and, and Dr. Luke's probably not given us all the detail, it's a summarized sermon, a condensed sermon, but at the same time, it's a powerful moment where Paul is being asked to defend his position. So mm. I, I think it's worth worthy of note on that, isn't it? It's not just a conversation. It is a, there is a trial sense to this. Yes. And I think as is the case often within the, the gospel narratives, and I'll include acts in that, there's a question at some level of, of who's on trial as, as, mm. as well, mm. isn't there? Mm. The, the, this is the gospel in in very new space for us. And I think yeah. that's worth remembering. Sometimes we get overawed, I think, by Acts chapter 17, because Athens represents so much for Westerners particularly. It's like the yeah. the heart of our notions of democracy. It's the the heart of our, our notions of philosophy. And I think what happens, and it's worth, I think, bearing this in mind as we hear Paul's sermon, is is we get a little overawed by Paul in Athens because mm. because I think our hold in our minds on the centrality of the Greek way mm. is is so prominent for us. It's how we, we build our cities essentially after how the Greeks imagined them. We we build our economics. We build our philosophy. All these sort of things, and it's easy to miss that Paul's there as a critic. <laughs> he's mm. he's not mm. there to actually approve of the, the Greek way. Mm. Um, this is not the gospel making the shift from Jewish to Gentile now in terms of what it is. It's the same message. Now, Paul yeah. comes at the message, we'll see differently. But I, I feel like, and maybe I'm not being as clear as I'd like to be, but I feel like it's worth us holding in our hearts as we hear this text that, that Paul is criticizing Athens as much as he's doing mm. in any mm. of the normal work. It's just that mm. this model is new for us because we don't get that sort of synagogue gathering that we have mm. come to expect in Acts. And when yeah. we have encountered Gentiles, they've been Gentiles moving towards God. They've been yeah. reading the Old Testament. They've been practicing the ways of Torah. That's been quite common for us. What's unusual with this is that backdrop Think about the Ethiopian eunuch, Cornelius. They all have a sort of baseline knowledge, don't they? That the yeah. gospel comes along and says, here's how we're understanding this story. Yeah. yeah. This is new space, so the sermon sounds differently. Mm. But mm. I wonder if over the years we've misunderstood why the sermon sounds differently and yeah. overly praised 
the sort of Greco-Roman way. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. It and, does. Uh, it does. It well. It's. It, I think it was a lovely play on the idea that potentially though Paul is in on trial here, there's a sense in which we could also say mm. he's putting a, a Greek worldview on trial. Yes. He, there is a, there is a clash of worldviews happening here, and yes. Paul is making some fairly substantial points in his defense in this mm. in this sermon. So yeah, quite amazing. So shall I read it? Yes, that would be amazing. Marvelous. So we've got to verse 22. This is where Paul begins and it says this, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For one man, from one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them, Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. My goodness, it's such a it's such a good text. <laughs> it I, is. I think I love this sermon because it's it is different. So it forces us to mm. listen to Paul differently, mm. which which I really like. Uh, and there are, and we should co- converse at some point about its uniqueness that that, that does mm. Does Paul's response in Athens ultimately lead him to think maybe this is not the best way to try and you know, tell the story? Uh, because it, it's so stark, even a casual listener is going to realize, well, oh, this doesn't sound like how Paul normally does mm. a sermon, does it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a very interesting uh, apparent change in style. With that. And I, I sort of, I, I mean, I noticed almost a little... It's probably too much to say a symmetrical pattern in the sermon where he sort of starts off by saying, find this altar to the unknown God. And then he launches into, let me explain to you who the unknown God is sort of thing. And then we get this sort of interesting little interjection where he quotes their own poets. Mm. And then out of that quote, he then there's almost a second major defense of the gospel. So it's like, it's like, it, it felt to me like there were two parts to the sermon. One kicks off by observation in terms of this altar to the unknown God. And the second mm. part kicks off because he literally is referencing their own poets, but then he mm. makes a dynamic point biblically off the back of quoting their own poets. Yes. It's almost like a, there's a symmetry to the sermon. It feels like, there's two parts to it, and they're sort of linked together by observations of their own culture. Mm-hmm. Is that is that a fair observation, or is that am I pushing that a bit? No, I think I think it's I think it's what I was feeling as well that he. The, I was thinking that the the sermon is very different on one hand, 
Mm. But to the point that I was making probably badly before you read, notice it's still a very Jewish sermon, right? Mm. So, totally. so what we yeah. expect from Paul is, I, I mean, I think this is, we expect him, he turns up in a synagogue, he argues from Scripture, which of course is yeah. what we would call the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible. There's no New Testament at this point. So it's always worth, I think, our listeners bearing that in mind, that whenever they're talking Scripture, <laughs> they're, they're, that's what they're talking about. It's isn't it? and yep. So they're arguing from prophetic text, Genesis, et cetera, et cetera. Then, they, then invariably Paul, and you see Peter do this as well, there becomes this point that, well, this is Jesus. This is, mm. this is who we were all expecting. Of course, he doesn't have that shared space with the Athenians. So he offers a different sermon, uh, a sermon from almost the more textual. And we, we see, like, I think this has shaped a lot of Western preaching. What's going on in the world around you that you can pick up on and then say something about and lead the conversation to Jesus. But if you look closely, it's a very Jewish sermon because the thing he chooses to say something about is the thing that really offends him as a yeah. Jew, which mm-hmm. is there's a lot of idols around here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. he, it, it's fascinating to me that it, that if we slow down and pause, it's a very, very much this type of sermon we should expect from a Jewish man mm-hmm. like Paul. That mm-hmm. look at all at some level. Can I say it like this, John? What this sermon is is a critique of the anti Shema nature of the context that he's in i get up every day i say hero israel lord our god the lord is one and now i've Mm -hmm. noticed you have many gods which is we know that like philo says that that jews never want to hear of the concept of there being more than one god and philo is a contemporary of paul's so this notion of monotheism is so central so in a weird way like as in weird for us it paul's actually very much on point with this sermon yeah, And then even when he makes the point in him, we live and move and have our being, he, as you say, he immediately brings it up with an allusion to, I, I, I think it's an allusion to Genesis and uh, Genesis one and Psalm eight, isn't it? That, you know, that's going on there. I mean, is that, is that helping what you're saying? That's, that's how I'm sort of seeing this. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I, I mean, I, I love the fact that it, in his introduction, Paul has shown both an, a, an, a keen observation not just in a general sense, oh, you've got lots of gods here, but he makes an observation about the particular sense that, oh, I've I've even seen an inscription to the unknown God or an unknown God. And he, so so I think even in that, he's showing, uh, number one, he's he's being observant and respectful of the culture that he's in, but he's actually using that as a gorgeous platform to say, well, Actually, I stand before you today as one who knows the name of this unknown God. I actually know who he is. Yes. And I'm going to explain him to you. And I love I love that. So he's not just he's not just being culturally sensitive or trying to find a cool way into the gospel, but he's actually identifying there is a real opportunity here, a real marker here for me to actually lean into. You have an altar to an unknown God. I'm here to tell you, I know who that God is. I'm here to tell you, I know what he looks like and I know what he has actually done and achieved. And 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 I love what could be interpreted as a sort of a, a, a quite soft, like culturally connected introduction. It's actually quite an aggressive introduction when you read it properly. I mean, if, if you look at it, look at that verse 23. He said, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. Well, that's, that's pretty strong. <laughs> He's saying, hold on a minute. You've got all these gods and you don't actually know who, who this God is. Mm. And then he says this, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. So, so I've, I've heard people over the years say that Paul goes a bit soft in Athens. Well, verse 23 suggests he's not going soft at all. He's actually mm. criticized them for the fact, oh, I criticize maybe too strong a word, but he certainly exposed an observation that you're worshiping something you don't even know what that is. So, you, so you, you, you don't know who he is. You don't know who she is. You don't know what it is. And then he says, oh, and I'm here, to, I'm here to proclaim that to you. So this is a very bold beginning. And again, I think if we remember that he's on trial, this is the beginning of a defense. 
he is saying, actually, I know who the unknown God is. And then he launches into what a sort of a, it feels to me like a little mini section there, David, verses yes. 24 to 27. It's almost got a very strong dynamic creational feel to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like he's contextualizing who this God is around the creation of the world at this stage. Mm. Um, and, and bringing, as you say, completely a very, very strong Jewish worldview on the origin of the world and how mm. how humanity came about. Well, I mean, if it's of any interest, which I assume it is because people are still listening to us. <laughs> yeah, at least three, at least three still <laughs> I, I was looking. I was looking. At, it never struck me until you were saying this just now, to, and, and I didn't count, and I should have. But in my Greek New Testament, what it does is along the outside margins, there's a constant run of biblical texts, and, and what this is is the the editors of the the Greek New Testament that I have have basically whenever they get a sense that there's an allusion or a Mm. reference or a quotation from a Hebrew Bible text. They list it there. And so generally speaking, when you're reading through, there'll be two or three on the dotted Mm. on on this. On this page, when Paul starts the Athens sermon, like there is, I mean, he he alludes to, according to the editors, he alludes to Genesis in in these three verses that you've just mentioned from, from, sorry, four, from 24 to 27. Mm -hmm. Here, listen to this. He alludes to Isaiah 42. He then alludes to some stuff from the Maccabees, which is from the Septuagint. Psalm 50, Isaiah 42, 57, Genesis 1, Genesis 9, Psalm 74, Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 4, Isaiah 55, Jeremiah 29, Leviticus 24, Psalm 145, and Jeremiah 23. <laughs> so so what that means, just to put it in context, is that that's not he's <laughs> quoting, but that the... the the editors of the Greek New Testament have yeah. noted that his yeah. language bears strong allusions mm. to these pieces of, of, of Hebrew text. I mean, mm. I, I think that's wonderful. That makes me really excited. To, well, I, I, I think it's a magnificent observation. And I mean, I love that. Uh, and, <laughs> and I think it strengthens the idea right from the get go that this is not Paul going soft on the Bible. Mm. So I, I, I think, I think again, I, I loved your introduction that, that Greece is on trial, the, the, the Greek worldview is on trial, not just Paul here. And Paul some, uh, Luke summarizes Paul's sermon in approximate, it's a, we, we, we can read Paul's sermon from beginning to end about two to three minutes. We know Paul did not only take two to three minutes here. So that, that this is a phenomenal, brilliant summary by Dr. Luke on the key points that Paul is making. And from the just from the opening paragraph, we have multiple allusions to the biblical text. Mm-hmm. So so to the to the untrained eye, to the to the casual read, this looks like Paul's just grabbing a hold of something contextual. Oh, there's a there's a, an altar over there to nominate an unknown God. That's well, let's have a wee chat about the fact that our God's a creator. And then and then you look a bit closer, and Paul is saturating his first paragraph response yes. with dynamic allusions to the Tanakh and to the Hebrew Bible. Yes. And and so this is a and and I would say this, David, and 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 maybe this is this is me pushing it too far. But again, Paul has such confidence in the biblical text, both in the way he's been trained and the way he proclaims, that he not only proclaims explicitly, but he he proclaims implicitly the biblical Mm -hmm. text. He's he's so saturated in the text that actually he's dropping ideas out, Mm -hmm. even without these people knowing that he's dropping in a Hebrew worldview uh, right in the heart of Greek Greco-Roman culture, and he's doing it in the most spectacularly brilliant way. To the untrained eye, it looks like he's like just gone on a wee bit of a waffly, a waffly conversation, but a deeper read. And this man is really presenting intertextual um, observation in the most dynamic way. I, I think that's. I mean, that's such a good observation for for us to, to hold on to it, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting that, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of a way to succinctly re- respond, but 
essentially what you're saying is, if I'm hearing you correctly, Paul's sermon is actually very similar to every sermon he preaches. Absolutely. It's just that the shared knowledge isn't there. So exactly. he he frames the stuff he normally says differently, mm. but you're still mm. going to get all the normal stuff, the supremacy of God, the oneness of God, the creatorness of God. And then stunningly, I mean, stunningly when you've actually begun it with a conversation about an unknown God, that this God, I mean, I, I love, look at verse 27, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find yeah. him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. I mean, Stunning. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I, th- there's, there's this sense, what I, here's what I love about what Paul is doing here, is there's a critique of, and let me try and say this carefully, because I want to make sure that I say what I actually want to say. There's a critique of their idol worship. There's a critique of their not knowing the God that they should know. Mm. A critique not, I, I mean, I think this is a false dichotomy, critique or criticism. I think we are overly nervous about the word criticism in the contemporary world. But, mm. you know, th- mm. there's, there's a critique of, of those two things. You're worshiping everything and you're even worshiping what you don't know. What there isn't a critique of is that they're trying to find God. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and I think a lot of a lot of Western modern preaching misses that, right? Mm. That 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 it's so easy to walk into a context and say, you're wrong. Right? Mm. Um, but what Paul doesn't actually say to them is you're wrong. He actually he actually approves at some level of their desire to try and find God. The mm. problem is he's nearer to you than you realize. You think mm. he's far off. And, mm. and I also wonder, I, 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 in one sense, like I, I love this notion that, that God, God is looking for those who are looking for him in idols. Mm. You, 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 like that's mm. I, almost that's what Paul's saying here. It's like mm. you're searching and groping, like that image of somebody in the dark and they can't yeah. quite, yeah. they can't quite. I mean, that's I mean that's what I think when somebody says groping and and searching. I'm, I'm imagining you know trying to make it to the bathroom in the middle of the night without turning the lights on, right? And yeah. yet God's actually super near to you the whole time. But the desire that's in you to find God. The people that are desiring God, God is desiring to find. I, I think mm. maybe I'd say it like that. Does that mm. does that resonate with what you think's happening here? It, it does. I because I, I I think there's a powerful um, that verse twenty seven is a powerful conclusion, mm. and this idea you've got what feels like a very clumsy word or phraseology mm. of the idea of of groping or searching stumbling around trying to find something and he's making that point in the very heart of this intellectual worldview a worldview that would have very very great confidence in what it thinks it knows and what it thinks it understands yeah. and and Paul is almost saying the the multiplication of the idolatry in this place is is a sign that you are you're actually lost you're groping for it's not that you mm. found anything you're still searching and groping um but i love that sense of grace that we've seen all the way through the book of acts mm. that he's saying he's saying e- e- even in your groping and your blindness god can be found because this god this and i love his language in verse 24 this god who made uh, heaven and earth, uh, this God who is the Lord mm. of all. Uh, that that beautiful combination in, of the Genesis language of the Creator God and then the Lord of Lord of Covenant, the Lord who reveals Himself. Mm. That that actually Paul is saying, this Lord is coming close to you. This Lord is here. If you will look beyond the idol, if you will look beyond what you think you know, or even what you think you don't know mm. if you look mm. beyond that actually the maker of heaven and earth is yeah. here he is closer to you uh than you think and 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 I love this sense that Paul is um 
challenging the idolatry around him, but in a, in a way that makes total sense. He's not simply saying, oh, you all need to get rid of your idols. You're all a bunch of pagans. Mm. He's actually saying that the very fact that you've got all this and the very fact that one of your altars speaks of an unknown God means you're still searching. Mm. You're still looking. You're still trying to find. And he's saying, I've actually found, or to use his language of verse 27, he has actually found me which yes. is more accurate in terms of Paul's yes. own experience. He found me, and because he found me, I can proclaim this God is known, mm. and he's here among you. So he's treading a very, very difficult line of he, he has to stand up to the idolatry in his world, but if he does it in a super confrontational and negative way, then the whole thing's going to close down. But he's, he's trying to show them that actually this God, who's not made by human hands or even served by human hands, mm. is, is close to them. It's that moment that you always run the gauntlet of in two texts, John, and this is the moment this in this episode. <laughs> Essentially what you've just said there is – what Paul does in Galatians chapter four, right? So, <laughs> so, so let, let me read Galatians chapter four, verse eight. He says this, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that by nature are not gods. Now, however, that you have come to know God, and then he interrupts himself, or rather to be known by God, mm -hmm. how can you turn back again to weak and beggarly elemental spirits? How can you want to be enslaved to them again? Right. So, I mean, what you've just said there, you, you think it seems like that's what Paul's doing here. I mean, in Galatians, he explicitly frames that that is one way that we know Paul actually thinks, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That that he, here, I know what you're doing now. I know what you were doing. But I love the fact that he he basically says exactly, you know, what you've just said. Now that you've come to know God, or actually be known by yeah, God. Beautiful. It's beautiful. I, and that's. I mean, there's a lovely. Uh, there's a lovely allusion to that in this. With uh, I, I, I saw it. And just again, one of the reasons I love listening to somebody read scripture. He himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. So, yes. like, hold that in your mind, and then think about. Indeed, he is not far from each one of us. Mm. It's like, you're not sure who he is, Paul seems to be saying. So you've put an idol up to an unknown God, not yeah. realizing that your life, your breath, all things are actually him <laughs> and freedom mm. are actually from him in your life. It's quite, it's that, it's, it's, it's that, it's that gorgeous, I mean, the early church fathers are really good at this, the, the, Christ in all things. Christ is not all things. There's, there's panentheism and, and, and pantheism mm -hmm. sort of challenge there. But but yeah. but God is in all these things. So of course he's near to you. Of course he's not far from us. And, and so I was really I struck when you were saying that. I thought it's it's a gorgeous, it really is worth us taking note of that Paul approves of the heart that is looking for God. And yeah. and, and his uh, I was. You've said this to me in context before when you've done work with me in churches I've served in. I remember us talking like this when we worked together at the college. There's this you critique specifically and praise specifically. And maybe you, you've probably said it better than that. But this notion that we have this tendency to speak in random generalizations yeah. so, so yeah. often. That was a great sermon, John. But we never yeah. really say what was great about it. We just say yeah. it was great. That was a terrible sermon, John. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually, it might just be that one sentence upset us and the whole the rest yeah. of the thing was fine. I love what Paul does here is he's very specific. There is a there is a specific problem with what I'm seeing, but that yes. doesn't mean that you are entirely wrong. And, and I don't yeah. mean that in a pluralist sense anymore. He wants to preserve that heart that you are looking for God. Yeah. Um, and I think he does that really well by the fact that he then he then throws out a quote and we should talk about this probably in future episodes, but he then throws out a quote to their own pro poets mm -hmm. to almost mm -hmm. make that point that even your poets are not always wrong. It's just yeah. they don't know. Does that make yeah. sense? Absolutely. And, and, and of course, just because he's quoting their poets and, and agreeing with them on one thing is not, does not mean he agrees with them on everything. 
but he simply so. and again i i think it's a it's a stroke of uh, that that's that little interlude in the sermon i think it's a stroke of genius in that it's a way of of reminding the audience that paul again is not just this jewish person trying to bang away at a jewish worldview and and hammer the greeks but actually paul is an intelligent man who has read widely and studied widely and understood even what their poets have said mm. about certain issues that are tender to him and mm. and paul has made this passionate case about the god who made the world and everything in it who is also this lord this known lord who is searching for them even though they're groping in the dark trying to find him and and then he he sort of almost builds a conclusion with the quote from the reports but also this becomes in a dynamic bridge into the into the final section of the sermon and and I love the fact that he's able to use the language of their poets not con affirming their worldview but affirming a worldview that that actually agrees with his worldview mm. and I think this is a careful this is a really really important thing I don't think Paul is is adapting the gospel to their worldview i think paul is saying your own poets actually agree with my worldview on this mm -hmm, issue mm -hmm. yes. so i think that's really important we make the, the differentiation this is not some sort of chameleon gospel this yeah. isn't paul going this isn't syncretism this isn't paul going oh well that's sort of slice and dice the gospel so it fits in every context this is paul preaching the gospel but he's saying actually isn't it interesting that that some of your guys have said something very, very similar to the worldview that I am espousing to you. Mm -hmm. I think that's 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 really important. The, the yes, as I think that's and that's what I, I I was alluding to when I said earlier as well. Like I don't think this is pluralism that's going on here. No. This is no. this is Paul making the point that they too can be can be right about some things, you know, but, yeah. but, but sometimes, and I think that's what his whole sermon is saying, actually, at, at that mm -hmm. level, his whole sermon is saying, you're right to be looking for God, mm -hmm. but you're, but you're looking in, in the wrong way. Yes. Uh, and I've been thinking about, I, I've, well, uh, let me say it like this, I, I've been reading the work of Maggie Ross recently and uh, her work on her, her stuff on prayer and silence is, is quite profound but she talks about intercessory prayer and, and one of her critiques which has really kind of kind of got me in that sense she says is so often our view she says of prayer is is actually i mean she doesn't say exactly like this but is actually a, a little similar to idolatry right because mm -hmm. what we do with idolatry is we, we we carve an image of the god so that we can say this is what the god looks like and the idea is that that i now can control this god this god now yes. lives in my house and will now be favorably disposed towards me or this god lives in my city and will be favorably be disposed towards us which allows in my attempt to control the god it actually then allows me a level of control of my own life right? because if i think the god's now controlling things and, he, and that god's now on my side then my life is more in control and you see this throughout scripture this is moses saying to god like give me your name because yeah. because i can control a god that has a name and and that, which is why yahweh's response is so amazing which is basically i am what i am right yeah. so so it's worth noting that idolatry is is always a notion of trying to control a God so that my own yes. life can be in the control that I want. Yes. Now, Maggie Rossi's critique is actually that's so often what we do in prayer, right? Mm. Is that we we bring to God our solution to the problem <laughs> and then say to God, right, you should do this solution. And we offer God one solution and then we walk away, right? Yeah. And, uh, and she says that what we should do in prayer is come to God with that which is burdening us, amongst yes. other things. Yes. Give it to God and then leave it with him. Mm. <laughs> and uh, not offering God, this is the solution that I want, but offering God, I trust you and and, and you will carry these things. And having, I, I was reading Maggie Rossi's work just from, not in preparation for two texts, but as we've been talking about this today, I been thinking that's, that's exactly what's going on here. Paul's mm. offering them a God who's in complete control of everything. 
Mm. But the journey to that God is to accept that in him we live and move and have our being, right? That actually, yes. it's way beyond our ability to control this. So, so there's this gorgeous sense that, that really one of the reasons we need to let go of idols, be they stone pillars in, in Greek gardens, or be they um, our view of how prayer works as a way of controlling God, they're all idols which resist the sense that this God made the heavens and the earth and sustains mm. even the breath in our lungs. I've, that possibly took me too long to say that, John, but do, do you hear what I'm trying to hold together in this? Oh, yeah, completely, completely. And, and I think you hear it in Paul's words that he doesn't live in temples made by human hands. He's not served by human hands. It's interesting. You get to repeat the idea of hands, mm. the yeah. shaping dynamic there. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That, that actually, and of course the idea of hand and idolatry go, excuse the pun, go hand in hand. So you, yes. you do get yes. this sense of that, what I what I make and shape, I control, and what mm. I control then is for explicitly for my benefit. Mm. And I, I think we've reflected before, possibly in our podcast, but you know the ultimate the ultimate expression of idolatry is making God in our own image, mm. or or even could it, could there be a a higher form than that? Actually, placing our own image mm. at the center. Of the God conversation, so so if 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 you look at a multiplicity of an of a a pluralist idolatrous context, you've got yeah. a range of gods which reflect a range of expressions and ideas and needs and desires mm. and agendas of human beings. So this is taking place on Mars Hill or mm. the Hill of Ares. This is this yeah. is the God of War. So. So there's a specific God for war. There's a specific God for fertility. There's a specific God for uh, financial prosperity. There's a specific God. It, it, and, and all of these are reflecting human agendas mm. rather than the desire to come to the creator of heaven and earth, come to the Lord of all the earth and say, actually, what is it you want? And what is it you want to make? I know what I want to make. I know what I want. I know what my agenda is. And if I am let loose, my hands will go to work at shaping a temple or shaping a God who looks a bit like me. But actually, Paul is appealing that this creator God who is Lord of all the world, actually, we must let go of that agenda and learn to surrender to him. Um, not the unknown God, but the invisible God, the God who will not subject himself to any form of containment, whether it be a philosophical idol or whether it be a physical idol. He is Lord of all the earth and he will not be contained. And that brings us to verse 25 in such a beautiful way when he says, not only is this God not served by human hands, beautiful allusion to the Old Testament there, but he gives himself to all mortals life. Sorry, he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. I think about that as a critique when you've got, here's our God of war. Here's our God of uh, love. Here's our God of something else. And, and now Paul says, oh no, this God, all things come from this God. Like there's, there's this beautiful sense of just having to hand everything over to him. So that's it for this episode. We know that there's always more to explore, and we encourage you to dive into the text and do that. If you liked this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you rated, reviewed, or shared it. We also appreciate all of our listeners who financially support the show, sharing the weight of producing this podcast. If you'd like to support the show, visit twotexts.com. But that is all for now. So until next time, from John and I, goodbye.